Well, welcome. 9 a.m. You are the true heroes. <laughs> Nine o'clock, friends. After the party, too. Mm -hmm. Oh my god. <laughs> All right. So yeah, uh, Adam and I are here for can we figure out this Drupal component thing already, or some variation of that. Um, it's a long title. It is. It is. But uh, yeah, we're excited to, uh, to talk about it. <laughs> I'm Nerdstein. This is the second time you might have seen this if you were in my earlier talk. Uh, I'm a VP of Engineering at Hook42. Lovely company. Check us out. And uh, for components, I've always been kind of curious about the space. Like, I've seen a lot of material about it, and I've seen many of his talks before. And so I started poking around and exploring it, and uh, decided to present with him. <coughs> yep, and I am uh, Brian Perry, and I do not have as strong a personal brand as uh, Adam. Uh, I've also given uh, zero keynotes at uh, this conference. Uh, but I'm happy to be here. I work for a company called uh, HS2 Solutions in uh, Chicago. I'm a lead front-end uh, developer. And uh, yeah, I'm also very interested in uh, kind of uh, component-driven development and design systems. Uh, and it's something I love uh, talking about and thinking about. And uh, we're about to do more of that. Cool. So here's a brief outline of what we're going to cover. So we're going to do a little bit of an introduction with some kind of baseline stuff and how all of this came about. We'll review some key concepts. We'll discuss implementation ideas. And then we'll go into some emerging technologies, concepts, things that could be happening in space. All right, so an introduction. Yeah, so this, uh, the is kind of a, uh, an ongoing conversation that Adam and I have been having for a couple of years uh, that started at mid-camp, I mm -hmm. think, and uh, I gave a talk on this topic, and then um, Adam had many opinions and questions afterwards, and it was the he, first time I ever, ever met him. He calls them opinions. I call them mm, maybe a debate, maybe a little bit of an argument, whatever <laughs> it was. It's in that space. Yeah, so, and, you know, we'll, we'll get to this in, uh, in more detail, but uh, I think our opinions on how to approach building with components in Drupal uh, kind of started out a little bit far apart, but over time, and the more we've talked about it and the more kind of best practices there, there are in the community, it's aligned for the most part. Um, we'll see some, some cases where we have differing opinions, and I think that'll make uh, also this uh, conversation fun. <laughs> I hope. So... Really, all of this is about two different disciplines. Um, it's kind of at a cross, right? So we're talking about things that affect technology and the web, and we're also talking about things that affect design, right? So they're solving very interesting problems, and often these problems have not been solved very elegantly in the past. There's a tension between design and implementation, traditionally. And so this whole thing is kind of a great way to explore this problem. How do you do this well? How do you bring these two things together in concert and coherently, right? Uh, design systems like Pattern Lab have tried to solve some of these problems because uh, it's basically a technical system, but it's meant to do design work, right? Uh, they leverage something called atomic design principles which are promoting these patterns of things that basically start from smaller order patterns and get reused to become bigger, higher order patterns. And uh, so most of the way that people approach these traditionally have been using it more like a high fidelity prototype, right? Like you can see something and it has design stuff on it uh, and it's a technical system, but a lot of it really, to me, is actually about, you know, making best use of that. I don't want to repeat anything that I do inside of a design system that I could carry over into my web system, right, or Drupal. So how do you do that well? Um, that's really what we're trying to sort out. And this is an ongoing discussion, as we talked about, so, you know, this is kind of where we are today with it, but if you see the talk, maybe in six months we could be totally different. I don't know. So, uh, but the key, the key thing here 
really what I was most interested in exploring is how do I reuse as much as possible from the design assets through the web. So we have uh, some examples uh, in the wild right now that people have tried to do this integration. And uh, I think, you know, I would classify most of this work as like exploration, <laughs> uh, more so than I would classify it as, you know, like solid, perfect solutions. And they might be perfect for certain cases, but I still feel like it's very exploratory. Uh, but that's innovation, right? People are trying to innovate and explore the space, so it's, it's natural. Uh, a lot of the examples that we have here, there's a Pattern Lab Drupal Starter Kit, there's Emulsify Drupal, that's a theme, Shyla is a Drupal theme, and there's several other solutions. Yeah, and the other thing that, that probably isn't in that list, but is worth noting, is just uh, also the idea of kind of rolling your own and, and taking this approach yourself in a custom theme, which is also super common. Yeah. And so um, a lot of this is really trying to either start Pattern Lab with something and take it or start Drupal with something that has a built-in Pattern Lab instance and reuse it in that capacity. So that's why it's very tightly coupled, uh, most of these solutions here. But there are some limitations. Uh, so when you tightly couple these things, um, there are drawbacks, right? So. The first being that really, uh, you might only be able to do it on one Drupal site. So if you're building, um, you know, a Pattern Lab instance is built into your theme, unless if you share that theme across multiple sites somehow, you're basically coupling it directly with your Drupal instance, right? Yeah, that it, it could thing. even be more than just one Drupal site, uh, but one Drupal theme. Like you couldn't even port it between themes in a Drupal instance. Yeah. And um, so, that's a big thing uh, about that embedding approach, and that's, that's fine uh, if it works for your use case. Uh, but in my opinion, I would like to have something that I think is a little bit more <clears throat> decoupled and sort of spread out uh, so that you can have a little bit more freedom. So if I want to use, say, a design library uh, for not only my Drupal site, maybe I want to use it for something else into the future, I would like to be able to do that, right? So the tight coupling is not ideal I think in a in a broader course and and it's not good you know to pigeonhole yourself either I don't think because you don't know what you might need way down the road so um, yeah and so there's also um, a lot of technology bias with some of these solutions too that like some of them might use SAS or less or things like that and I don't really you know to me I don't I would rather use a technology that I'm comfortable using and have something that's able to do that, you know, instead of the other way around where I'm kind of forced to use something that is prepackaged with a tool. Um, and I would say, I think the biggest drawback so far that I've seen with existing things has just been the lack of documentation. Like, it's just, there's no documentation on like anything, right? So it's actually really hard to know why did you choose to do this this way? And why is this thing coupled in that way, right? Which, so, which I think is also ironic as many of these tools like Pattern Lab, you know, specifically have ways to incorporate documentation. <laughs> yeah. So the key thing is really not getting locked into any certain limitations or any specific approaches. So having something a little more flexible was ideal in my mind. So um, after meeting with Brian and hearing his talk and getting interested in this topic, I decided to write a blog post on this on my personal blog called Exploring Simplicity in Drupal Design Components because I wanted something simple. I wanted a not tightly coupled, easily integrated tool, right? And so um, we had a big debate. So a lot of the things that you know we were debating were kind of articulated here. <coughs> but I really wanted to start to define and understand what other approaches could exist. Like why did people build the things that they built already? I wanted to start from the ground zero, right, and work my way up and understand all of it. So uh, so that's what I did, and um, I had a designer. Uh, mock up a new uh, Drupal 8 blog for me, a new design. 
And I decided to take that and roll it into Pattern Lab and then try to integrate it into Drupal. And that's what I did. The, it's not live yet though, so you still see the old, <laughs> the old thing. Uh, so I want to talk about like the space of the problems that I ended up running into because I think that's really important to understand conceptually what is happening between these two systems and how you might want to integrate it. So the first problem that I explored was trying to create something that was fully decoupled. I wanted a pattern lab that was sitting over here. I wanted a Drupal that was sitting over here. And that's it, right? So um, the, uh, the primary uh, goal that I was trying to overcome was making sure that I was avoiding that tight coupling. And basically, I thought, like, you know, in the experience that I've had doing this work professionally, that this would basically resemble what an enterprise would want to do, right? Because if you have, you know, a company and they have, say, 20 to 30 different sites, microsites, or a homepage, you could have something like this set up with a separate pattern lab that would integrate into all of those sites independently, right? So I felt like it was definitely better for reusability, for scalability, and portability. Those were the three uh, areas. And one thing that I really wanted to try to understand is could I create, as much as possible, a shared technology baseline between the design system and the content management system? So they would all be using the same kind of tools as much as possible, or you know maybe I could remove some tools from one of the systems or the other to simplify it. Like that's kind of where I was looking uh, at. And, and the reason why this is important is because, especially for, for all of you in the room, you need to use tools that you're comfortable using, right? <laughs> it's, it's what works for you and your team. And so I think it's really critical to try to understand like what are the problems that you are trying to solve and then pick the right technology that fits for you, right? Uh, and so what are the types of things that uh, that were looked at? Well, you know, Twig was a big one because I wanted it to integrate with Drupal and Drupal supports Twig. So I used that as the, uh, the markup uh, language, the templating engine or whatever that's called. Uh, but you could pick anything else that you might want, uh, but your mileage might vary depending on what you want to integrate with. Um, but it also applies to um, things like CSS as well. So, um, you know, you could pick a framework like Bootstrap or something like that, or maybe you want to use CSS Grid, um, but you might might also want a task runner or something like SAS or Less or Gulp or Grunt and all those technologies in that space. So you could basically choose that for what works for your workflow or your system. <coughs> One of the key things about uh, choosing um, SAS or less or anything like that is basically trying to consider what you need to do to package assets from one system to another. So if you're using the design system, you're basically going to have to try to get the stuff out of it <laughs> to go into Drupal, right? So it's really important to understand, okay, how do you do that elegantly? And having a tool like Gulp or Grunt does that well because you can basically aggregate uh, all the, the SCSS files and run it and put it into one file that is easy to map to a Drupal theme. And we'll, we'll talk about that specific issue a little bit more, but I feel like that's one thing on this topic that people have been talking about having an external design system, uh, but the specifics of how you actually achieve that, I feel like we haven't been talking about quite enough. Agreed. Uh, and then this goes right into what we were just talking about. So the packaging of the actual assets themselves. This is a big deal, right? So your design system can have anything from JavaScript, images, CSS files, you know, markup, right? How do you basically take and wrap things and make sure that it can be delivered to another system? So often, um, an easy way to look at that or to do that is to use something like Gulp or Grunt because you can basically put all the, the files together and aggregate it into one CSS file, as an example. But things like JavaScript and things are a little bit more complicated. So generally, I've actually recommended using like third-party CDNs that can download shared libraries and then just use that as a reference so that it's the same between both systems. That tends to work out better. Um, 
But depending on the actual consumer of what you're doing, that's where the choices come in, right? So that's where you have to figure out how you package it. So in this case, right, if I want to consume it with Drupal, then I have to be mindful of having something like Twig, right, in my design system. And that has to be something that is easily packaged within the patterns. <laughs> cool. But uh, bear in mind that um, everything that you need to do also depends on both systems, right? So you have to be very mindful of what choices you're making uh, when you're looking at how the two things need to work together. So. The next point is the implementation of the design system within the content management system. So you have everything ready to go and packaged, so then how do you take the what you basically created and packaged up and then you know implement it inside of the CMS. So as a fully decoupled system, the, the CMS probably has the most degrees of freedom in how you can implement these, these assets that are coming from the design system. So there's a lot of discretion, like tons and tons of things that you can think about and wrap your head around to make sure that you're making the right choices. Yeah, which I think is part of the problem and, and led to so many different approaches to do the same thing. Agreed. And then one thing that, uh, one other really important problem to understand is change management, right? So these are not, you know, static things. They're going to change over time. So how do you uh, know uh, and plan for that ahead of time within, you know, either your workflows or uh, your... Yeah, your ongoing needs. So consider like you want to make a design change in the future, right? How do you do that well? And how, if, you, if they're coupled together, right, are you going to break the site immediately if you push a change in one? You might. So you need to understand exactly how these things should go, and I'll talk about some ideas uh, around that in a few moments here. All right, key concepts. Okay, so... Uh, how many people in the room have done extensive or uh, any sort of database work before? Right, cool. So you all should understand a bit around normalization, right? Normalization is a big topic that people, you know, do whenever they're doing database work. And there's a lot of similarities, a lot of parallels to the design systems and atomic design in that regard, right? So. Um, you know, in databases, if you're normalizing, you're basically splitting out things into different data structures, right? And you have tables, and those tables join to other tables, and you're basically not repeating any data across, uh, you know, any of these tables. So there's a lot of parallels with these things, too, for Drupal, right? The fields and entities and entity references, there's a lot of parallels because those are both data structures. But patterns, I kind of view, are the same type of philosophy, right? So you have these, these patterns, and you start with the smallest possible pattern, which is an atom, and you reuse that and roll that into a molecule and an organism, and then a page, basically. And so uh, the end result is a page that has, it's comprised of multiple patterns all over it, right? And they reuse those patterns in any way that you know, is appropriate. And so uh, the key part of normalization to bridge that back is really around making use of the smallest possible patterns that you can have, right? And that goes down to the atom level. So atomic design principles are that, is that promotion of that. And uh, it basically is uh, kind of advocating for a principle called dry, which is don't repeat yourself. So. Very, very similar in the, you know, the kind of computer science space, but new way to look at the problem, I guess, in more of a design system-centric way. Yep. And as far as uh, atomic design, uh, from my perspective, you know, I, I really like the uh, concept that, that this is getting at and the idea of breaking things down into their smaller component parts. Uh, I do feel that sometimes people get a little uh, hung up on the specific terminology. Uh, so from my perspective, you know, as long as you are doing something that allows you to follow that concept of breaking things down into its smaller pieces, um, you don't necessarily have to be hung up on atoms and molecules and organisms and things like that. And, and lately in projects I've been using 
other similar terms. So, yeah. Awesome. And so the design systems that exist are really supposed to represent the ideal view of what something should look like and how it should behave, right? Uh, and I, I feel like everybody started this space thinking that this was really to be used for prototyping because that was a major problem that I think that people were struggling with uh, originally uh, in design. But as it continues to grow and expand and the technology matures, it's becoming a lot easier to reuse these assets now in other systems. Like they're standardizing on certain technologies and certain practices and it's, it's getting better. So you can basically then treat your design system as the source of truth for the look and feel of your site entirely. And it's, cap uh, it's definitely able to do that. Uh, and so one thing that I feel like is critical is the KISS concept, which is keep it simple, stupid, right? That, and was, that was mean. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so this is a great way, I think, to actually approach the problem at a high level, you know, and think about how to design things. Patterns should be simple. Like, they should be the rudimentary and very, very straightforward. The processing of those patterns should be simple. The data models should be simple. You're seeing a pattern here, right? All the things that comprise of the, the uh, design component should be very straightforward. The data processing within a pattern should also be minimal, right? That stuff does not carry over well or elegantly to something like a CMS, right? Because the CMS is going to have all this processing power and the ability to transform and translate and all this other stuff with the data that it is storing. If you do all of that data processing in the design system, it's a bad mix. It never really goes well. You often have to map data to certain paradigms and certain formats, and it just doesn't go well. It's not clean. So you should try to reduce that as much as possible. It, so having the design system just present the ideal data in the way that it is supposed to do uh, from a, a prototyping perspective, let the CMS go and handle all the data processing and the crunching and everything like that. Yeah, I also think that uh, something that, that I try to keep an eye on uh, is if there is a lot of processing and a lot of logic, that potentially is uh, you know, a little bit of a warning. And maybe it's something that needs to be broken down differently, maybe there's a simpler approach, uh, or maybe you, you know, you're just doing too much in your design system. Uh, but yeah, it's a, uh, a bit of a warning, warning sign. And so, what, what does simple look like, right? So here's an example of like a, a social media uh, pattern that shows, you know, a list of like icons and yeah, from different social networks. And you'll notice that I basically spell out every single data value. There's no transformation, everything that gets rendered, there's the image, there's the link itself, there's no um, yeah, there's nothing. It's just the raw values of what you can expect. And this is pretty straightforward, I would think. And then this is the associating uh, markup, the twig markup, that renders that data, right? Which is also, in, I think, pretty straightforward. I am literally just spinning out <laughs> the data. Uh, and that's all that the design system is really owning or doing. There is a for loop here because it is expecting more than one element, but that's really about it. So um, having things be this simple is great because then whatever the CMS system needs to do to generate this data, it can handle. The next uh, idea, I guess, would be really discussing the uh, least responsibility principle. So if the design system maintains what is known as the ideal, the CMS is basically responsible for conforming to that ideal. So the CMS owns the responsibility for doing the integration. That is where that lives. So the CMS system also has to do all of this processing and the data and has to own its own architecture uh, and map its architecture into the design system. So more often than not, that does mean that the data needs to be transformed 
or it needs to be mapped. And there's a good parallel to like migration work if anybody has ever done that before. So you, you kind of map existing data structures to new data structures, right? And that's kind of how all of that goes. Um, but the key aspect of this is understanding that every CMS system is going to process things differently. Every CMS system is going to have their own data structures and their own architecture, right? So it has to own it. The design system will remain completely agnostic to that. And I would say, uh, I've seen people in the past try to build in CMS specific functionality inside of the design library, and that is bad news. Bad, bad, bad. You will keep doing that repeatedly over and over and over again for every system that you would try to integrate. That's just bad. It becomes a mess. And, and it is very common, I think, in uh, most Drupal approaches to this, most contrib themes that, that do it. Um, so yeah, it is just very explicitly coupling you to Drupal. Cool. And so here's an example of this mapping like I'm talking about. So uh, using the components module, I believe. Uh, this is a, a Drupal twig file that basically does nothing but include a uh, pattern lab twig file and map Drupal elements to their pattern lab equivalent. So you can see we have a title field that's mapped to title, uh, URL, body, a list of tags, and a date that was posted. And all those things just go in the right order and where it's supposed to be. Yeah, and this is a nice simple example, but it can also get uh, pretty hairy pretty fast depending on how your uh, pattern is structured. Think about things like getting uh, an image path or like uh, alt text for an image. You have to have more knowledge about uh, like Drupal's render arrays, and uh, so it, this is a, a nice, simple example, but it is certainly not always that simple. And then the, I think the other thing maybe just worth, worth mentioning, so Adam mentioned the components module, uh, that at molecules is a, uh, a custom twig namespace provided by the components module. And what that just lets you do is uh, reference uh, templates that are outside of Drupal's uh, common templates directory. Um, it just lets uh, Drupal discover them elsewhere. And if you are going to use a external design system, you have to be able to do that. Indeed. Okay, so one other really cool thing to understand, because we're, if we're advocating for reusability, right, we want to be able to try to keep uh, the patterns as uh, extensible as they possibly can be, right? And one way to look at that is through um, variations. So patterns have different uh, attributes that are defined in the data, and we saw that, right? Like there's a title field and a URL and all these other things. But um, that often gets rendered right to the page, like, hey, I'm spitting out the title. Hey, here's the URL, and it goes into the markup. But the data doesn't have to be rendered, that you pass it. The data actually could be something that generates conditional logic, or as metadata, say maybe you want something to be styled in a red way, or you want something to be styled in a blue way, you can pass that, as you see in the image here, you can pass that as a parameter in the data, right? It doesn't have to strictly be things that are rendered. So that's a great way to approach things about um, how you know to make a specific pattern extensible, right? Because then you could have the same pattern be doing a lot more than what it traditionally would do. Otherwise, you would have a red pattern and a blue pattern and a green pattern and all these other things. You don't need that. So this is just a, uh, a, a little bit of a more detailed example showing what that might look like. Uh, a lot on the screen here, but just at, at a high level, there is the template up top that is a, a, a card pattern from the design system. And you'll see that there is a modifier variable, and that just lets us, in this case, pass in a uh, class modifier. And then uh, based on that, so we have the, uh, in this case, the presenter template in the middle that is uh, mapping the data from Drupal into this pattern in your design system. And we just specify that modifier class. Uh, you know, maybe we're actually going to pass it in explicitly. Maybe it's something that's configurable in a dropdown in, in Drupal. But when we specify that uh, mCardProviderModifierClass, class, 
that's just going to you know, trigger some uh, additional overrides in our CSS. One really key thing, and this is more of a be best practice technology recommendation, is trying to make sure that you're adhering to the standards that exist in this space, right? Um, they're really important, you know. It's important because, like, you know, we see things in Drupal, right, where uh, someone's working on a site and they need to get some help or something, and they're doing things in a way that doesn't observe the standards. It's actually a lot harder to follow, right? It's harder to get into and, and actually do the work. Um, so, what are some standards that are important inside of this space? Well, first is the atomic design standards. Understand how they work, right? Like, uh, don't repeat yourself and everything that we talked about. Uh, also, uh, BEM, uh, BEM. Uh, Brian probably knows a lot more about that, but that's a way to structure your CSS uh, in a certain convention that um, you know is predictable. Uh, SMACS is the same thing. Uh, but you know different standards around the CSS, and then also um, you know when you're doing the integration, make sure that you're leveraging all the Drupal best practices and the framework that it is expecting, uh, and anything that could inherently go with like the CSS or the JavaScript frameworks that you pick. Uh, they all have their own sets of best practices, so you just have to be mindful. Yep. Yeah, and I think it's more than you know just following. These rules, they especially when looking at a design system, uh, have some advantages. One, it will help you understand uh, how it maps to things in your design system if you have a good uh, class naming convention. Um, and then that also helps uh, make the classes explicitly apply to the components that you want them to and prevent cascading issues and <laughs> things like that. So yeah, uh, what we'll shift over into this point, so we, we talked about uh, kind of uh, best practices for the external design system. Um, so now, how that would be uh, implemented in a CMS, in, in this case, looking at it from the perspective of Drupal. Mm -hmm. So this is a situation where, um, while we do have a lot of similar opinions, uh, as far as how things are implemented on the Drupal side, we do have uh, some differing approaches. So. My focus tends to be on uh, the ease of component integration, so making it easy for people to use these components. And uh, today, to do that, uh, I still lean on some uh, contributed modules. And Adam uh, is very focused on a more uh, platform agnostic approach that we talked about, which I, I agree with, uh, but also really drives to uh, favor things that are in core. Yeah, and I generally prefer things that are more programming centric instead of site building centric, and that's just my, you know, preference. Um, but yeah, and I I do always my I have the golden rule which Brian doesn't like or care about, but uh, it is basically you know if it's in core and you can use something in core, use it. Like because I feel like it has the most set of eyes. I feel like it's on every Drupal installation that's out there, right? So, like that's how I tend to approach things. Yeah. And I care about that, uh -huh. <laughs> and agree with it in general. Yeah, whatever. Uh, but yeah, when the rubber hits the road. Um, yeah, so let's talk about uh, the process to actually take this external design system and uh, use it in our CMS. So uh, in the design system, we'll have uh, tagged releases, and um, I guess we can talk a little bit about uh, how those assets are, are going to be generated. So we talked about using uh, a task manager like uh, Gulp or Grunt, and uh, so typically what I'll do there is I'll compile just a single CSS file, but multiple JavaScript files, so you, we can include the specific JavaScript where it does or doesn't need to be used. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we'll use Composer to pull in uh, the design system as an external dependency like we would for other Composer projects. And then at that point we can uh, do the work of mapping the, uh, the patterns into, or mapping Drupal's data into the patterns. And then there's also the process where we will, you know, when necessary, take in new releases of the design system and then make adjustments as we need. And it's all done through the tag, by the way. You make a new tag and then you push that tag when you're ready to release it into 
the Drupal site. And that's the key for mitigating the risk of if I click refresh and I made a change over here, is it going to break it? Right? You do it when you, you know, if you release it, you do it when it's appropriate. Yes. Unless you're one of those people who just runs Composer Update all the time, but that's probably the least of your problems. Um, <laughs> Uh, so this just uh, talks a little bit about like how that actually works because I feel like uh, this concept of not having your design system be something that lives inside of a specific theme is something that we talk about a lot uh, but don't show enough examples of how it actually works. So in your design system you'll have a simple composer JSON file that just defines uh, the project and then in uh, Drupal uh, you'll reference the Git repository uh, in your uh, Composer file. And then this is just my personal preference. Uh, there's a lot of different ways you can handle this, but um, I like to configure it so that the design system actually goes into the libraries directory, making it uh, very clear that it's you know, a dependency that you shouldn't be editing. And I don't often, I don't do that personally because I actually prefer to leave it in the vendor directory and just let Drupal cache it like itself. It actually, that's my approach. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, you, uh, Composer, require your uh, design system. So this is just a quick look at what some of those elements look like. So the uh, Composer JSON file uh, for the design system up top. And these are just the relevant snippets from the Drupal projects, uh, Composer, JSON. So reference to the repository, the design system is required, and then uh, we specify where it goes. And note, note the use of the tag on line 10 there. That's exactly how you do the releases. Yep. OK, so then uh, talking a little bit more about actually implementing these patterns in, in the CMS. So some things that are potentially uh, like misconceptions. Uh, one is that you're not necessarily going to be uh, mapping everything one to one. So uh, maybe some of the smaller elements that you're using uh, you're not going to map directly to into Drupal and it's uh, more uh, a molecule or, or organism that is going to use those things. Um, and also because the, uh, the CMS is handling the mapping you can use these design elements however you want. Um, and then another thing uh, that just I've found useful is just having a clearly defined way to handle when there need to be overrides. So if there's something that either needs to be changed or, or is like Drupal specific, or if there do need to be adjustments made to a design system element, what do you do? So if there's a clear process to where overrides go, I think that's helpful. And then also that makes it clear that you may have to do something. Like, does that override have to be re-implemented back into the design system, or does it really need to live uh, here in Drupal as an override? Um, and then also, uh, yeah, I think we kind of covered this with some of the other, other bullets, but like, uh, even things like uh, the larger uh, components like pages may not actually be necessary to map specifically into uh, your CMS. Yeah, there, there's a ton of discretion in what you map and how you map it. And I think that's the key thing. You don't have to, if you have a pattern in your design system, you don't have to have a corresponding thing in Drupal. It's not a requirement. You can do whatever you want. I'm going to go get the phone. Okay, that sounds good. Yeah, I appreciate that. Someone really needs us. <laughs> yeah, okay, so, um, uh, as far as uh, the, uh, the tools and, and modules in Drupal that allow you to, uh, to do some of this, uh, represent these patterns, essentially. Um, so here are some things in core. Uh, so there's custom block types, uh, layouts, um, and the, the most important thing there from my perspective is the Drupal layouts themselves, so layout discovery, essentially. Um, and if you picked up the phone, big thumbs up. Great yes, time. thank you. Uh, so defining those layouts in a way that Drupal understands is, is the important part. Uh, then there's things like views and uh, view modes for content types. And this is a situation where there is definitely not one specific answer. There are a lot of different ways that you can represent these things. And it probably depends on your build, what your team is familiar with. Um, but the idea here is that you're just finding uh, like Drupal's, Drupal's hook into a template that then can be mapped to your design system. 
So that's what uh, lives in core. Uh, as far as some things that are kind of must use in contrib, we talked about the components module. And uh, if you do want to have a, uh, uh, basically templates that don't live in the templates directory, you have to use that. Um, and then Adam has a module block type templates, which uh, gives you some extra uh, template suggestions related to blocks, which is nice and handy. And then there's things uh, that are commonly used in uh, contrib as well. So there's uh, everybody's friend paragraphs, um, and that is a uh, really easy way to be able to represent uh, your patterns as uh, reusable things. It's very commonly used with this approach. There's also the UI patterns module, uh, which I like quite a bit, and that is a module that actually lets you do uh, the mapping that we talked about in the Drupal UI. So you uh, define your patterns in a way that Drupal can understand, and then at that point you can take fields and put them wherever they need to go. Uh, I think it is uh, really, that concept is, is really excellent because uh, there are, are definitely challenges with that uh, mapping. And then there's also things like Display Suite, uh, personally, it's not something that, that I use for a variety of reasons, but uh, also often used. And I think like this slide basically is where Brian and I probably differ the most in our opinions in the world. Yeah, because Adam just loves paragraphs. <laughs> so, I actually think you can do pretty much 90% of what you need to do using custom block types and entity references and inline entity form and all of that type of stuff to get the exact same functionality. Now, it doesn't mean though, I think the big thing that Paragraph solves is actually a usability problem. It's very clean, it's very easy to set up the things inside of Paragraph, so kudos if you want to do that. But it's not a necessity, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I agree with all of that, that it, you can do it without it, but it, yeah, a lot of it is kind of the experience. Mm -hmm. And we'll, we'll touch on a, a couple other things related to that in our emerging concepts. Um, so, I mean, I touched on this with uh, UI patterns, but uh, my personal opinion, and this is a, another kind of difference in, in preference, while the twig mapping approach uh, works, and, uh, you know, if I continue to use it on projects, and it's commonly what people do within Drupal. I would really love to see a reliable, consistent way to handle that mapping in the Drupal UI, or at least to have the option to do that. And uh, the UI patterns module, a couple screenshots down at the, at the bottom, uh, provides a great way to do that. The uh, layout builder project also kind of gets at similar things, and it provides a, a visual way to add your components to a page and uh, specify your data. So the, the thing that still, uh, for me, is not completely clear is how those things live together and what the right mix is to achieve this. Uh, but being, having the option to be able to do this in the, the Drupal admin UI, I think, is really useful and, and really important. And then this is a, a little bit more of kind of a uh, little bit uh, more uh, interesting concept, but um, so the, the UI patterns module uh, also conceptually always had the idea that it would be able to discover um, patterns from a design system, which sounded kind of lofty and crazy and impossible when I first heard about it. Um, but someone actually implemented uh, a, a version of that for the, the fractal uh, design system. And I took a look at that and it made a lot of sense to me, so I actually ported it over to Pattern Lab so it can the module can actually automatically discover uh, your um, components in Pattern Lab and then represent them as UI patterns in Drupal so you can use them and, and map data into them. Uh, the thing that I'm still trying to figure out is how re realistic that really is to use with existing design systems. I think with a lot of the heavy complicated mapping that typically goes on in a lot of these um, you know, Pattern Lab driven themes it's probably not practical, but I still think it's a, a very interesting concept and providing a way for uh, Drupal or other CMSs to automatically discover these components is very interesting. So this one's an interesting one. All right, so Gutenberg. This is definitely an emerging concept uh, and originally when this was first written, this was just a WordPress specific uh, tool. 
But uh, as of, I think, a couple weeks ago, or not too long ago, uh, someone uh, for Drupal Europe submitted a session about integrating Gutenberg into Drupal. Uh, I think Gutenberg is um, very interesting in terms of a technology. I think the main benefit that I see from it is really about the experience of using it. It's a much better editor than something that's like, you know, your typical WYSIWYG. Uh, I think WYSIWYG is going to be dying and going by the wayside probably sometime in the next 10 years. Uh, but it never seems to go away. I don't know. But it, to me, Gutenberg is wonderful for that the experience, but where it really falls down is actually in how it structures data. Most of this is unstructured as it uh, stands right now. And that's actually very, very difficult, I think, to do um, uh, with design systems and the integrations and things like that. And really, it's just best practice to have good data structures, right? So using something like this, to me, is like my big red flags are going off in my head, like, ah! Don't do it. Yeah, but it's just, from my perspective, also another example where it just really reinforces how badly people want an improved experience here, no. and, and also a consistent way to uh, you know, be able to use uh, the components of something like a design system. Uh, and I just want you know, <laughs> uh, maybe fewer options, fewer, fewer crazy ideas, uh, you know, some sort of alignment there, but we, we got a ways to go. And then the other thing that kind of falls into uh, this category that, that uh, is a bit, Adam and I both kind of need to look into a little bit more is uh, web components. So this is uh, a, a more like web spec way to be able to uh, provide reusable components. Um, and the big thing from my perspective has been kind of tracking support for it and, and how well it's supported. Um, and that continues to improve and they can work with uh, JavaScript frameworks a lot better nowadays. So, um, I mean, the idea of having a kind of uh, web standard way to be able to create and share these elements is, is really attractive, um, but need to do my homework. Yeah, I mean, I agree. Like, the, the standard aspect of it is really what's, what's critical here because then you're getting something that is adopted that's not technology-centric and you don't have any vendor lock-in or anything like that, so, yeah. And that is it. We're a couple minutes uh, past time anyway, but I'm sure if people have questions, we could probably sneak them in or talk afterwards or maybe call us on the phone out in the hallway, something like that. <laughs> but uh, thanks. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, question. Yeah. 